Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, hello, members and friends of the Retail Design Institute. I'm Cynthia Hirsch, International President. Welcome to the second part of our career building series, Will You Look at My Portfolio? I hope you were able to be a part of the start of our series, Can I Send You My Resume? If not, and you missed it, no worries. It is available on our YouTube page. Do you have a portfolio? Is it relevant in today's world? Here to help dive into portfolios, do's and don'ts, we welcome back Winston Wright of Whispering Loudly. We have Margaret Trujillo of Senior, Senior Program Manager of Strategic Remodels at 7-Eleven and Sharon Lassard, former VP of the Retail Design Institute who has many years of experience leading teams on both the retail side and design firm. And here to help lead the questions and answers is returning Genevieve Davis of 7-Eleven. So thank you to our panelists and welcome. Before we get started, I'd like to say a quick thank you to Planet Construction, our international sponsor for the Retail Design Institute, and remind you that this Friday, we will be hosting our third CEU course on sustainability. Visit our website for more information and to register. Like last time, we'll start off with Winston, who will do a quick presentation, and then we'll take a look at two portfolio samples, one from a seasoned professional and one from a graduating student. We will be discussing the portfolios as we go through them. You will be able to ask questions to all of our panelists throughout by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, let me introduce Winston Wright. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm going to share my screen now and get started. So thank you for having me back. Um, greetings from New York City, where it was a beautiful, bright, sunny day today um, for the first time in a lot of time, in, in, a, in a lot of time. My name is Winston Wright, and here's the gratuitous plug. My consultancy is called Whispering Loudly, and we're in the business of brand. And um, my uh, last year and this year's client stable includes Time Magazine, the Clark's Company, ADMI, and Lee Hecht Harrison, where I do career transition consulting. So this um, job search series, I'm really enjoying doing. So part two, if you remember last time, um, may I look at your resume? Will you look at my portfolio? So this is body of work tips for job seekers. <clears throat> So let's start at the beginning. Everybody knows how much I love to do this or you know, you do now. No dictate, only direction. There's no silver bullet or a sure shot, only subjective best practices and suggestions. I can't, with, with this particular presentation, with this particular subject matter, I can't emphasize subjective enough. Um, portfolios, like any other piece of art, like any other collection, of anything are very subjective. So kind of keep that like orbiting your mind as we go through this. Um, and remember in job search, there are no tea leaves and no tarot cards. Like everything in terms of messaging and um, yeah, messaging and communications, content is king. You've got to remember that. So let's talk about portfolio. <clears throat> this is the origin of the word, and it goes back literally thousands of years, and <clears throat> it en it ends up meaning, and and at its at its very at its very root, to traverse with a leaf. And over the centuries, the Italians turned it into portfolio. Um, and what's interesting about the origin of the word. If you really want to go way, for, way far back to, say, transversing a leaf or crossing over with a flower, that's pretty cool. As if, you know, carry sheet weren't cool enough, that's very cool. And my first portfolio was this big vinyl 22 by 28 thing with handles that had page after page after page in it. 
and I lugged it around New York and London and all over the world. Um, and historically, portfolios had been printed out, put in a book, um, but with the increase of internet and email, there are now lots of substitutes. We'll touch a little bit on websites and, and, and some other digital forms of communication a little bit, a little bit um, further into the presentation. But remember, it's 2021, the paper and the case, you may want to do a printed book but you're also gonna to wanna to do some digital work as well. Webster calls it a set of pictures usually bound in a book, a selection of students' works compiled over a period of time for assessing performance or progress. Wikipedia calls it an edited collection of artists' work, different samples of current work that typically reflects the, be the best work or depth in one specific area. When we, we're gonna to get to the kinds of portfolios that you can create a little bit later. But I think that this is imp an important thing to start thinking about is how are you gonna present your work? And this is my favorite definition. The SCAD calls it a professionally presented collection of one's strongest artistic work. I think that's a really good defini definition. So how do I define it? A visual abstract, abstract arranged sequentially or by category of work produced by an artist, highlighting and presenting the best examples of their work, identifying their collaborators and visually illustrating their abilities, processes and successes in a creatively development, developed clear, concise, muscular communication. If you remember last time, clear, concise, muscular communication were with the resume, they are with this as well. So you gotta remember, job search is a marketing campaign and your portfolio is another tool in that toolbox and it's arguably your power tool. <clears throat> Resume portfolio. We're going to go back to Latin. See, um, of life. Corpus opera. Opera is the plural of the word opus, O P U S, which means work in Latin, and corpus means body. We're talking about your body of work. Your book is, an, is another communication tool, if not the other communication tool in your job search. And what are your messages? These are the things you need to be thinking about when you're putting together your portfolio, just like your resume, what are your messages? Your main and supporting messages? Who's your audience? And I've added this for this session. What's the call to action? What are you trying to communicate? Who are you trying to communicate it to? And what do you want them to do? I think it's really important, and I regret not putting this in the resume section. When, when you're communicating, what do you want your audience to do? You want them to react in some way. You want them to say, can you start Monday? Just remember, you've got to think about what the outcome here is. And remember, just speaking of audiences, you're designing a piece about design for design people. Everybody here is the just like me, but nobody How do you want it all fine? Well, your resume most or
most recent a student recent is it and of a look category crimes cheers consumed with some brand experience. So if that's in there, if you've done that, included in your portfolio, just be sure to qualify where, what your contribution was. Third, you could do your portfolio is by project new brand execution concept, a collection of fixtures, a series of windows. I've worked for Macy's. Let's go. In some versions, Scott, here are the, fla here are the eight flower show windows, eight times 20 flower show windows I did this year, this year, this year, and this year showing some progress, a store store rollout, an interactive training guide that you've directed the all that you've had, um, that you've contributed to in terms of this is what we want people to know, where you've included that, included in your portfolio. Tonight we're going to talk about a very basic, very basic category portfolio. And what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Leo, right? We talked about Leonardo da Vinci when we were writing his resume. We're going to go back to him in terms of his portfolio. So this is where we left young Leo or old Leo during the resume process. And part of what I, I hope you remember is these competencies, these categories of thought, work, creativity, were the things that rose from the top. Those are messages in, in, the, in, the, in the construct of what am I good at doing? So as you're thinking about your portfolio, you also want to think about your resume in terms of how they're going to connect, how they're going to orbit one another, how they're going to loosely connect with one another. Because remember, I keep saying this, this is, this is a communication stream, and this is just one part of it. Write yourself a brief. What's the background? How are you going to do it? What do you want to communicate? Process, finished product. Is there a story behind it? Conception, development, deployment. Outcome is critical. Know generally what you want to say about each example. Talk about your partnerships. Talk about credit to the team. Give it a name, portfolio. Set your objective. What do you really want the result of your book to be? Determine that. Determine the kind of, the kind of place you'd like to do it, meaning the kind of place you would like to practice your craft, do your work, whether it's in the convenience store sector or the luxury sector or the automotive sector, think about when you're putting this book together, who you're, who you're talking to, your, your audience. Just like any graphic communication, determine the basic composition style of the book and the individual pages or images and let the form follow the function. At the same time, let the content inform and influence what your layout or what your progression, your visual progression might be. What's our deliverable? A category specific portfolio. We're doing this one in an 11 by 17 book format, adaptable to PDF, exportable as a video, and optimized maybe for mobile. We're gonna talk about that a little bit too. Remind yourself of your main messages and supporting points. 
Where are you strategically? What's your process? How good are you tactically? And how collaborative are you? The required content in Leonardo's portfolio is going to talk about those areas from his resume that we identified as his strengths, engineering, war sciences, creativity, and collaboration. So this is the common thread from one communication to the next. And who are you going to be showing it to? In HR, you're going to show it to people. You're going to show it to creatives. You may show it to the sales team. You may show it to a member of the board. Remember your audiences. They're really, really important. I want to talk about a minute about some default mechanisms that live in our brains in terms of how we absorb communication. As Western speaking, Western language speaking people, we read left to right, top to bottom. That is the default movement of our eye. When we see something printed or when we see something with images and print on it, that's the default mechanism. So you got to think that that's the way the eye is going to look. Number two, 90% of the world is right-handed. It is a natural inclination when faced with this much information to look right. It's just a natural inclination. And lastly, um, when we see a list, we automatically put it into a descending hierarchy. After Gutenberg printed the Bible, the next use of the printing press was newspaper news. So this is where we've developed this default mechanism in our brain. Headline, subhead, body copy, body copy, boring copy, follow-up copy, continued on page 12. It goes from Cathedral Dome Falls to the, it was built in such and such a year by such and such a person. So remember these default mechanisms as you're putting together your portfolio. And don't forget, you're creating a piece about creativity for a creative audience, for creative people. Remember, please, you're wild. Get creative and be memorable. The imagination imitates it's the critical spirit that creates. I want you to be memorable, but I want you to be memor memorable for the right reason. And I love this quote. There's only one thing in life worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about. You need to leave after showing your portfolio or having that interview. When they're talking about you behind your back, you want them to say, oh yeah, the guy with the crazy portfolio or the guy with the portfolio that was a movie or whatever, rather than, oh, that guy with like the, that boring portfolio, I want you to be memorable for the right reason. So let's talk about paginating this very basic category specific portfolio <clears throat> remember from leo's resume engineering war sciences creative ed execution and collaboration i've paginated this this way a front cover table of contents and intro engineering war sciences and i've added a bridge in here that i call something interesting just to break up the visual monotony then we're going to go back to painting, creative execution, drawing, creative execution. A surprise at the end, something that's interesting, that's just a nice surprise. And then, of course, the back cover. So it's a small portfolio, but you're ready to create it. So you've done your homework. You know what kind of paper you've going to look. It's going to be parchment. You've selected fonts. You've decided your copy color. You've collected all your images. 
and you lay all this out on the floor in front of you or on your screen with post notes or whatever, and you lay this out, you paginate this. Let's just go through now. I'm going to make very little commentary. Let's just go through now Leonardo's very basic, category-specific portfolio. Like I said, I'm just going to let you guys read this. I'm going to jump in a couple of times. This page is an opportunity in this case to give a little brief bio and a little brief overview of your, your body of work. Remember, this is the left-hand page if this is an open book, and this is the right-hand page. War Sciences. This is the left, and then this is the right. So here's my surprise, since this was a category specific portfolio, I thought it would be interesting to, like I say, to drop something in here that's a little, that's a little different. It just breaks up the monotony. And this is the very beginning. Remember, this is the left-hand page. And as the paragraph says, this is the first thing he ever drew. It's a drawing, it's a sketch of the Arno Valley, which is where he was living with his family. Very troubled, twisted soul, Leo. Tough childhood. Um, and this is what he saw from, I guess from his kitchen window maybe. Portraitures and paintings. Remember, start with, remember, show your best work. And then this is the right-hand page. Portraits as well as other paintings. And illustrations. Anatomy, animals, faces. Again, in this introduction, in this, in this, this, you can, this is kind of a, you know, remember this is the, the, the left, the left-hand page. You, um, here are my illustrations, anatomy, animals, faces. Set it up, make it make sense. And then here's the right-hand page. Over here on the right, I've put in this copy block. I think this is a, another, opportunity to say something to communicate something a little bit more i i made up this story about how you know he loves to study motion and movement and 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 flow and then you know of these these three women are all three different illustrations but i was just fascinated by the fact that that the, they're all looking down they all look Pensive. That says a great deal about an artist. That's that. That's a default illustration of a woman's face for this particular artist, and I think it speaks volumes about just a, the way an artist is thinking. And I think it comes across here. You can 
where we took collections. Um, if any of you have, have looked at Uncree, um, who's the founding principal of 8 Inc., which is the company that um, designed the Apple stores, published a book earlier in the month. It's called Return on Experience. It's on Amazon. I highly recommend you get it. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the most preeminent retail and commercial design firms in the in the world and at the end of tim's tim's book he starts off a, a, a his his appendix with design is not done in a vacuum and he acknowledges people who have worked with him influenced him been a part of his work over the past 30 years in the last three pages of this book and it's over 400 names remember people this also shows if you take this opportunity it talks to that collaborative spirit that you have and then here's this so, uh, another surprise just one more <clears throat> this is about his commission with Lorenzo Sforza, the Duke of Milan, which we know from his resume. He did these sketches. And then in 1999, a Japanese sculpture, sculptor did one. He made a model, he did the sketches. A Japanese sculptor did it. And this is maybe his idea of what the statue that he was hired to do that never got installed might look like at the palace where he was supposed to install it. And, uh, So this is an iPhone. On my screen, it's to size. On your screen, it's to scale. So whatever screen you're looking at this on, it's, it's either to size or to scale. But here's the thing. A laptop and a 24-inch monitor and a 13-inch monitor and a 27-inch monitor are all going to show this at a different actual visual size. On my 27-inch Thunderbolt display, this iPhone is actual size. And I just threw together this little movie, and these are two and a half second intervals. And I did it, number one, to show the do it. You can turn Leo into a movie or through. I turned this into a movie out of, I exported it out of Keynote into a low res movie optimized for video at 760p and it's, it's 40 megabytes. What I did not do was go into the images and res them down. So I think if the images were res down, it could probably be e emailable. I think it would be under 25 megs. But I think it also shows you how difficult some of this might be to see on a mobile device. And you might want to have a mobile version that's big pictures with fast motion that lasts, this lasts 56 seconds. Maybe you wanna do a 60 minute portfolio version that's big images, big copy that can be viewed in about a minute on a mobile device. Make sure you have your book edited. Proof it, reproof it, Run spell check against it. I didn't have any spelling errors this time, Cynthia. Proof it again. Have somebody else proof it. It cannot be shown unless it's perfect. 
key takeaways, no surefire format, make your plan, remember content is important, know yourself and what you're trying to clearly communicate. I can't stress this enough and give credit where credit is due. It's not about you, it's about them. It's about what you bring to their table based on your talent, skill set, brain, successes, and in the case of a portfolio, proving it with your work. And I thank you for your time. And I thank RDI for inviting me back. I hope I get to come back again. And we're going to go to Q&A. That's provided I can stop my screen share here. There we are. Hold on. Okay. Thank you so much, Winston, for sharing. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to share the portfolios. And Genevieve, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Cynthia. So we have two portfolios that we're going to share with you today. One portfolio, the first one we look at is from a student who is a recent graduate. So you'll get to see someone who's new starting out in the industry. And the second portfolio that we're going to be looking at is of somebody who's more seasoned and has had several leadership roles within um, her career. So um, Cynthia, if you don't mind going on to the first one, and also everyone, just so you know, what we're planning to do is take, we're going to pause at every, every couple of pages and ask some questions and get some comments from Margaret and Sharon. I have the box open for your questions and answers. So if you have any questions at all, I encourage you to please um, type them into the Q&A section and we'll make sure that we get those incorporated as well. So, so Sharon and Margaret, um, I think, wh what are your thoughts on this for a cover page? So first impressions are most important. As we saw, this is Margaret in Winston's presentation. Um, it's it's your the first moment that we get to see um, your aesthetic, your point of view, your um, creativity. So th this first piece in a portfolio to me um, should communicate all of that. And so it's an interesting choice of color that um, this person chose in terms of like the gray and um, all of that. So that's my first clue into, into their mind and their aesthetic and the story they're telling. So um, it piques my interest and in, um, I think that's what you want to do um, with your portfolio. Sharon, I see you went off mute. Did you have any comments? I was going to, I know we're going to go to the next one, but maybe I'll just sort of make one quick comment here that sort of ties to the next um, page. You know, one thing that we've been talking a lot about as um, a panel group prior to today, and then it'd be really interesting to get, you know, as we open up the Q&A later, but a lot of um, portfolio reviewers or even resume reviewers these days, the hiring um, side of the business, they're really wanting to have, um, uh, I don't want to say a more generic approach, but um, more gender neutral or, you know, candidate agnostic, if you will. So one thing that we talked about was instead of having, you know, your name as bold as it is male or female, you might want to be a little bit more subtle and it could be just your first initial in your last name or just your last name. So again, there's more of a gender neutral um, approach to your portfolio. I think that, I think that, that Sharon brings up a really good point in that let's let's cut through potential unconscious bias let's just get past it absolutely um and also i have a lot a question here is this particular portfolio in pdf um or is it web-based it looks like this might be a pdf this is a pdf great but as we get deeper into the portfolio, there was actually a link um, that you can click on to, which would take you to a web-based portfolio. I think it's on the next page. Yeah. yeah, we can go to the next page. So here to what Sharon was saying, where we were saying about um, keeping it a little bit more gender neutral, 
also, you know, there's a big question about putting photos into your portfolio. So I, I think that your point about keeping it gender neutral is important and just more neutrality. Um, I think, I think, and, uh, and yes, you're right. We do have this link over here. And in, in my, my feedback in terms of the link, um, you know, there should be a design aesthetic in your entire portfolio. So just putting the long form URL, um, I think there's some other ways to embed the hyperlink within your portfolio. Um, that's a great point. That's more creative. Like, you know, you don't have to put out the long form. All right, next slide. Here we have um, a really great table of contents as we were reviewing this portfolio. I think we all kind of liked the thumbnails and giving you a sense of what is to come. Um, what, are, what are your guys' thoughts on this? I, I appreciate having a table of contacts, contents and, um, you know, depending on how busy I am and if it piques my interest, I might, you know, jump around to something that's, um, you know, in my hiring need that I would want to pour into, like, um, go to the, you know, um, coffee um, tab. It, it helps me quickly at a glance see what they're presenting and uh, draws my interest into the, um, into the portfolio. I agree. I, I like the combination of visual, um, sort of a the client or um, the the actual project work, and then a little bit of description. Um, it's a real nice synopsis, and would want that to sort of tie in with the balance of the portfolio um, to be able to have that continuous thread. And, um, you know, also think about this if it were on a small screen, um, you've got the little thumbnails and words, it might get really small, but it also could be, again, just sort of a snapshot on what you're about to dive into as you get deeper into the portfolio. And, and I would also challenge everyone as they're developing these and maximizing it for, you know, the digital environment, um, you know, if, if you're going to do this, you know, really challenge yourself to make these interactive so someone could click on this and go right to the, to the page. Um, it, there's a lot of tools and uh, platforms out there that can help you do that. So I think- One more question, guys, about being gender neutral. Um, what are your thoughts about just having a logo instead? Well, it, uh, I mean, mm, logo. Mm. Uh, you, know, you know, for me, that it, <laughs> that involves an exhaustive brand study, right? Um, <laughs> right, Sharon? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that, that 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 really requires just a whole lot of philosophy and thought. If you're gonna, I mean, in my view, if you're gonna do a logo, you know, do a monogram, do your initials, mm -hmm. and and be done with it, unless you've, you know done enough self-brand work that you've established a brand of yourself to that level. Yeah, I agree. It, the The idea of, of being a little bit more neutral is just, there are so many um, companies out there, uh, agencies out there that are really just trying to look at qualified candidates and having the best work presented and the best resume to articulate, you know, your experience. That's what you want to think of the, you know, putting your name in bold or putting your face, you know, as sort of the entry into your, your work is probably not the best way to do it. And that's really what that comment was about. It's, it's, it's so when a, when a hiring manager is looking at my work, Sharon's work, and Margaret's work. My initials might give it away. I mean, I'll be I'll be frank, but I could maybe change one of them. SL could be Sharon, Sam, Susie, Solomon, whatever. Um, Mar MT could be Margaret, Mike, Michelle, Mark. The idea here is to cut away any notion any 
chance of unconscious bias. So if it's WW, SL, and MT, I'm going to pick the best portfolio and go from there. So here is um, the first project highlighted. It's Capital One. We see our one in the corner for our chapter one, along with a project heading. Do we feel like, I, I personally like the formatting on this page. Um, what, what are your all thoughts on this and the way that it's teed up? I think what's hard is we've all had a view to the balance of the portfolio and, and maybe not to go, you know, page by page as we get deeper in. Yeah. But I think one thing that an overall comment is, is yes, how does, how does each chapter tie back to the, the table of contents page or the chapter page? But then how do the visuals and the narrative complement and not get too wordy and not be too, um, you know, white paged, if you will. You know, so here, if we were to just purely talk about composition, it just feels very empty, especially if we go back to Leonardo's portfolio where the use of the page was really well done. It almost felt like on every single page, there was very little white and just a lot of content. And so I think that's, the overall comment, um, bigger images, combination of size and scale, great narrative to talk about, you know, what you're sharing here, um, but fewer words. Here we get into that section more on the on the actual project. And Cynthia, do you want to flip maybe flip through this first chapter and then we can comment as a whole? So if we want to go back, um, so so folks, what are your comments on this chapter? And for the audience out there, we are kind of flipping through quickly. Um, Winston, Sharon, and Margaret have had a chance to look at these portfolios um, prior to today. So um, they are, they've are they already established some, some of their comments. So, so my overall impression was, I, I really liked the balance of photographs and narrative and text and, you know, sketches, but it, it was hard for me to understand um, this person's role and where um, what their contribution was, and so I wanted to see more about um, you know their their point of view, their contributions, what their role was. Um, it, it seems like they had a wonderful output, but I wanted to know more of their journey through this process. And if I can tag on to what Margaret's saying, I think. Your, your process, your design thinking, how you got to the outcome and what problem you were trying to solve. Like how do you clearly articulate the problem, the solution and the, and the how you got from point A to point Z is really important, especially for a hiring manager because he or she is wanting you to be on a team. You're not an individual contributor anymore if you're a student. Um, if you're in a leadership role, you're, you're taking on you know, that oversight of a team. So you're really wanting to look at what are those and, and we'll get into that next portfolio. But I think on this one, Margaret puts in a great point. This is a student portfolio, but you probably had some input, um, or if you didn't, then what was your process as an individual contributor? Absolutely. And I think on a previous page, it, there was a photograph of somebody else who is not the, we have our tech concierge here. And that was going back, that was something that confused me when I saw the one photo of somebody else and then another photo. I had a double, do a double look of who is the second person. So that was, that was a piece of feedback that I had. Now for section two, yes, if you could flip through. 
One thing that I like is having these little sketches, the hand sketches. What panelists, what is your opinion on that? I think if you're going to leverage a hand sketch, um, you have to be intentional about it. Like what, it, what are you trying to deliver to um, the person, the hiring manager or the hiring panel? Um, you know, there, there was little or literal stick figures in some of the sketches. So, you know, it, is it a quirky kind of um, sketch or is it a, is your intention to show that you, you've got that ability to um, be able to concept hand sketch um, and communicate a, a concept from a sketch? So, um, and, and if, if I may, Margaret, this is a great example of what I was talking about earlier about the way we read, the way the eye reads top to bottom, left to right. There's a sketch and then a 3D rendering and then there's another sketch at the bottom. People are gonna look at this and they're gonna default into this left to right, top to bottom. But when I go here, because of that default mechanism, I'm overwhelmed. I don't see a rhythm here that makes a great deal. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the, dis, a, with the disrhythm that I see here. So, and, and again, I would just comment on this in terms of, um, you know, what is what was this person's role in development of the construction documents? And, um, you know, I, I produced this, my contribution was this. I, I want to know more about, you know, what can they do? So I have a question. How much, I think it's hard because you're submitting your portfolio and it would be great if you could always give an explanation and walk the person through the portfolio and then you can articulate that. So how, how do you recommend being able to share what you did specifically on the portfolio versus as you're explaining it to somebody? So for me, like again, if, if this is all your work, in your narrative to be able to explain that and sort of be done with it. But then in each chapter, I think it's really important to set context because if you're just looking at this really briefly, there are a lot of words and a lot of small words. Um, and so we're all visual people and back to Winston's comment about, you know, how do you bring your best, best work forward? We're, we're, you know, presenting to a creative, whether we're there physically or, or not. So what story are you trying to tell and what does this work represent to best represent you? And without having to read a lot of text, I'm not quite sure. So as Margaret was just articulating, it's like, I, I know I'm looking at some great illustrations or some great, you know, documentation, but why? We just got a question. How much text is too much text? And, and how do you spend time reading everything? And Winston, if you wanted to, I'm sorry, I interrupted. So, so pure, purely from a, 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 a visual, from a, 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 a visual perspective to talk about the contribution, I might even think about making a boilerplate that goes on every page. That's a very direct mm -hmm. communication. My role was X. My team was either this person or my team was this role, this role, this role, and this role. My process was working with these team members to deliver X. I would, I would come up with a boilerplate message that explain that and rubber stamp it purely from a communication perspective, I would come up with a consistent format that explain that and put it on every page. 
And is there anything special about what you delivered? Did you deliver it faster, better, you know, in a, in a constrained environment where you had limited resources or time or, you know, I want to, I want to feel the energy and the, um, the cadence of how you work in, in what you're sharing with me. That is a great point. And then we also have another question about process and demonstrating that process and how it can you use the sketches to show that process and going from the sketch to the refinement to the final product? Absolutely. And that's something that I was going to suggest. Again, thinking about how um, Winston had the layout of, you know, Leonardo, uh, Leonardo's, you know, portfolio, the usage of the page and the interest of each page, all we're, not all we're looking at here, but, you know, each page where we, we've looked at something different. And so from an interest level standpoint, you can help show your process by starting with a sketch or starting with what problem are you trying to solve, you know, in terms of words and then have a sketch and what was your thinking that represents that with precedent imagery. And then you got into, you know, some more sketches with a little bit more, you know, form to it all the way to then construction documents and cross sections. So like that is showing process and showing how you worked either by yourself or with others to get to that outcome. Here we're looking at, it looks like a coffee um, installation, a millwork concept. And then um, his, this section on artwork. How do you feel, um, if you just go back to that one, how do you, if you go back to the artwork, how do you feel about the way the artwork is presented here? And on the next slide. I'll jump in. Um, if, you know, if, if page one was to talk about artwork, it all felt like one, one type of artwork. Whereas when you got inside that section or that chapter, you have illustration and, um, you know, other types, I'd have all that representation on the first so that you understood what you're about to see. Cause this is all charcoal. Um, or, you know, do you just have illustration and then you have more of the content inside? Um, again, I think it gets back to um, Winston's example. And of course, Bob didn't have this and that's why we're doing a critique. But, you know, what's that pagination of your book? And how do you really craft it so that there's consistency in terms of its feel and then, but there's interest in terms of every chapter that you're bringing forward. Do you feel like um, we, you know, folks need to have an art section if they're incorporating their hand sketches and their art throughout the rest of their portfolio? I don't, I don't, I don't think it hurts. Don't, yeah, it's a preference. Yeah. But in a, but in a, in a, in a, let me just quickly address this page because we're talking about this whole category and we're talking about this pagination and flow thing, what, what would instantly tell this story better would be illustrations, detailed drawings, computer generated drawings. Boom, boom, boom. They don't have to be of the same thing, but I'm going from a, a seal to over here, the the pedestal, there's, again, again, it's that visual flow left to right. That, that would be my advice too, is in the arc of the story that you're telling, can you incorporate and highlight your skills and your work and your ability to, um, you know, navigate from, you know, hand sketches to Revit to modeling, you know, show, show us that arc on a project you can. And so I really want to talk to you guys about this page. So um, as you can see, this is slide 27 of 27. So there, there's not a final end page like our friend Leo had. Um, and also 
what are what are your thoughts here on this particular uh, demonstration? My question would be again, what's the purpose? Um, and if the purpose is, I can transform a space that looked like this into a space that looks like this, then I think we talked about as a panel team, you know, do you show before and afters? Um, again, that's sort of illustrating a process, but through photography of before and after of a remodel. Always think of intent. I also had questions here on this. I think that these photos are beautiful. This house looks beautiful. In addition to the before pictures, what was your role in this project and that process of um, how did you come up with this design? How did you make these selections uh, to tell more of the story of this project? And um, depending on what that story is, maybe it constitutes more than one slide. And for me, you know, knowing this is the last page in the portfolio, um, you know, there's your first impression and your last impression. What is what is your call to action? What is your statement that you're trying to communicate on this last slide? Like, make me hungry, make me want to see more. Give me, you know, for more information or more details. You know, I I want to know, um, you know, how you can sell your talents and your skills. And um, if I if I want more information or I I want to make it easy for me, this 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 last page is your opportunity to, um, you know, have your your final stamp and um, yeah. remember you. And like Winston had said, having your contact info on the last page, uh, I think is a good way of, of drawing that call to action. Like, hey, call me, reach out to me. I think overall, this is a really strong portfolio and, um, you know, really, a really great job. So now we're going into our second portfolio. This portfolio was created by somebody who has been in the industry for longer, who has held leadership roles. And um, so you get to see somebody on you know, the other side of the coin. Here, this individual starts out without, without that cover page front of the book like Bob had. Um, here we just start with a version of the resume. What are your thoughts on that? My comment, uh, sorry, Margaret, um, is it's a portfolio. Um, you know, maybe this would go in the back um, or there could be a hyperlink that links to your um, resume and, and hopefully they've already either seen your resume because that's why they're talking with you because of the portfolio. Um, or if you're doing an online application, usually those two things are separate. But I think having a hyperlink or having it in the back um, and not have it be the first thing of your portfolio, as well as how do you condense it down to just be a one pager um, versus having to flip back and forth. And so we see what about their point of view, you know, in terms of how they how they influence the how their role it's a really interesting um you know perspective that this person has because they're they're richer in their career they're they're on the business development side now and the client relationship side so so what is what is their influence and point of view um throughout this process you know sharon's talked about it before how how did they translate the client's needs and um, their client's challenges into a design team um, to, to get to this point? What, what is that arc? What is that role that they influenced? Yeah, and just to pull that apart a little bit more, I think this particular portfolio, um, again, we've seen it um, prior, the format is consistent in terms of who is the client? What was the project? What was my role um, as the portfolio owner? And because most of it is around business development and client relationship, so who was the team? Um, because the work, what we're showing here is the work of the team, not necessarily the work of the leader. And depending on how this person is presenting themselves, Am I going after leadership roles that show that I'm a great 
um, business development person? Am I a creative leader? You know, am I, you know, a brand representative? You know, what is my role broader than these dot points? And then what are some of those true elements that I would want to add in here to, to elaborate more on my personal portfolio, because the finished work is not necessarily mine. It's a collective um, of architects, interior designers, graphic designers, visual merchants, you know, et cetera. So just make sure that we're representing the collective work appropriately um, so it's not misunderstood. And we just had a, another question. Is this a business development professional utilizing a portfolio to approach a transition to a design role? Would you use this portfolio as somebody who is seeking a business development role uh, or, or would this be if you're going, trying to go more for a leadership, a, a, a design role? Well, that's, that's where I think all three of our comments have come from. Okay. We have questions as the hiring manager or the panel. <laughs> And then we have another uh, we have another question here. Say you have a really long career spanning various industries, retailers, and design firms. How do you condense a thirty year career into a reasonable length portfolio? How long is too long to show your breadth and depth of experience? Great question. Probably all of the panelists have that point of view. <laughs> uh, and in some way, shape or form, um, it's, it's what best, I mean, I'm in that situation, what best represents my diverse background and to be real crisp and concise in terms of what was, you know, what was the role that I played how big was the team or not? Um, you know, what giving credit where credit is due, especially if you have that type of tenure, showing that you're collaborative, showing that you're agile, showing that you've got a diverse, you know, span of experience. That's what you're trying to sell. So what is the work that best represents that? And personally, I haven't gone over like 10 projects. I think that's even too much. I would say seven. My point of view on this is, is editing and customizing your portfolio to the audience. There's nothing wrong with having, you know, 10 portfolios. If you're going after an opportunity and, you know, edit and craft and tailor your portfolio to fit that need. Those of us that have a long career and multiple experiences, we've got that advantage where we can edit and call our collective experiences and tailor it to the opportunity. Um, that that would be my advice. Is you know some of the some of your experience might not be relevant to the audience, so don't include it. You know you want to make a great first impression and a great last impression. So so customize your portfolio to fit the need. You don't have to have one that fits all all. So in, 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 the, in the age of desktop public publishing and digital, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think you could have multiple portfolios that spoke to multiple things that you've done. Um, yeah, I, I think, that, uh, Margaret, I think that that's a great point. I wouldn't do it in a resume um, because most resumes are chronological, but yeah, you could you could easily tailor a a a, a body of work to a, a specific role. I said this with the resume, and I'll say it again with the portfolio. But this is um, it's a presentation document, and I think that sh this is an opportunity to demonstrate that you can edit and that you you have that skill because editing is a skill as well. One of the things that we mentioned when we were talking about this as far as formatting goes is that we liked that it was consistent, but I think it was you, Winston, who had the thought of maybe instead of keeping the font all on the upper right side, maybe alternating and putting it on the left to move it around a little bit. Especially if it's two, fa two facing pages, you know, you could, it, they would be right next to each other, upper right and upper left. And again, just, it, it's this, it's it's just what's your what's the visual comp composition mm -hmm. 
-hmm. of the page and in, 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 a, in, a, in a situation where it's a printed book and it's a double page spread, you have to look at that double page almost as one as one page. If it's again though, if it's a if it's a PDF like this, so you could argue consistency. I, 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 the consistency is here for me. The excitement isn't. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Um, somebody said that both of these portfolios were PDF based. Do you feel it's necessary to have a PDF if you have a web based portfolio? The web based portfolio being more flexible. It could format to both desktop and mobile very easily. I, I, I think for, for a hiring manager or somebody to say, can I see your portfolio, portfolio to send them a link is magic. I've got two perspectives on it. One is, there's definitely hiring panels and managers that um, want to be able to print something and, you know, make their notes on it. You know, some of them work that way. I, my advice is to, to be fl provide a flexible um, opportunity with your portfolio in terms of like straight up PDF. That's standard in business. Um, everyone can connect to those. And then, um, you know, give links to your website, give links to, um, you know, some of the other materials that you have, but make sure that those links are maintained and they're not broken. And that when you send someone to your webpage, that it is also um, encompasses all of the aesthetics and typography and color and, you know, what, what your message and your brand is to that audience. Um, the, the PDF portfolios, you know, I've worked at, at big, huge corporations where we've actually got to file it away and it's a, you know, part of your record and your appointment. So um, I, I think both is probably a good, a good option, but depending on the, um, the hiring manager, a, a web is um, just, just as good. I also think you have to be careful about um, if, if you're doing a PDF um, and, and this is, you know, this is where people who know Adobe Creative Suite far better than I do, do, do well at it. You, you, you've got to remember your file size, right? There, there are some companies whose servers say, if, it, if an attachment is over 20 megabytes, it ain't coming through the wall. That means if you're at 20.1 megabytes, it's not going to go in. So you've got to do some research and some thinking around how do you get the best resolution, the best quality in a portable document that isn't, you know, the, the size of a full-length feature film? Um, we have another question. If you've been published, how do you include that? Would you put a page of the magazine article, the cover, the blog posts, if you do speaking engagements? How do you include that in your portfolio? I bet you that's David. <laughs> um, that's a great question, David. I would ask the same of you. <clears throat> no. Um, a lot of that I know you have on your LinkedIn page, as I do as well. Um, and I always have my LinkedIn um, link, you know, hyperlink available. So I, personally, I think that's where all of that belongs because it's more social and more media, <laughs> no pun intended. And really the portfolio is more of like work done or collaborative work done um, that's visual. So that's my personal approach as I've been, you know, looking at um, what's next, but I'm open to what others think as well, but that's how I've done it. I, I, I agree with that approach. Concur as well. D draw me in, make me want to seek more, make me want to go stalk you on LinkedIn, make me you know, <laughs> explore your website. 
And then Cynthia stopped sharing her screen. So that was the last page of the portfolio. Once again, um, you know, that call to action and the contact info was not on, uh, was not part of that portfolio. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was the first portfolio was about 27 slides. The second one was eight slides. And the first one came from somebody who did not yet have any job experience. The second one came from somebody who had a whole breadth of job experience. So what are your thoughts on portfolio length? And, and did you feel the first was too long or the second was too short? Or, or did what were your thoughts on that? Well, I'll, 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 I'll start with that. I, that's, that's this whole notion of, of of pagination, you know, start at the beginning. What's the story you want to tell? And to, you know, to Sharon's earlier point and, and to, to, to Margaret's, you can have two or three portfolios. So if, if you're going to start with a, you know, with a general portfolio, I don't know, I guess, I, I guess my approach would be make a master portfolio. And if it's a hundred pages, it's a hundred pages. Make a master portfolio, and then when it comes time to send your portfolio for a particular role, go through and pick and choose the 12, 8, 16 pages that best represent what you're going after. Um, I think Leo's was, I think it was, I think it was 12, I think it was, I think it was 12 pages, front cover and back cover, 14 14 total images. Much past that, I'm going to get bored. Unless, you know, there's a, there's a centerfold, you know, you know, and that, and that's why I put that surprise. In it. Like, that, that's like, that's like a centerfold. You know, there's something interesting there. It's a gatefold that, you know, that, that, that's why cosmetic companies do eight panel gatefolds in the middle of Vogue is so that you'll do that. So uh, you know, I don't think there's a rule, but I mean, think about it. I think, you know, much past 12, 16 pages, I'm going to get, I'm going to get crazy. I, I, I want, and I'm, I'd love to hear Margaret and Sharon's view on this. I want, it's like a meal for me. I want powerful, powerful taste in small, digestible portions. That's the way I eat. That's the way I think. I'd rather have one spectacular double page, double spread than I would six pages of prattle. That's such a powerful way to express it, Winston. And I think for the folks that are very early in their careers or haven't started their careers, that that they have that same ability to to give that powerful, um, you know, message with their portfolio. You don't have to have a lot of projects or a whole bunch of experience. If you can tell your story in a beautiful um, way that you want to eat it up and and savor every bite. Even one or two projects or, you know, from your, your educational experience, that can, that can make me want to um, have you part of my team. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I think, I, I think sometimes in cases like this, not only do you remember your, your wild, but you, re, you remember your Vandero. Less is more. Yeah. <clears throat> and going back to the question about, you know, um, having a book or speaking engagements, et cetera, think about why people read your book or why people, you know, come listen to you at a conference or, you know, why people were interested in listening to us as panelists today. Like, what's your story? And, you know, what's been really interesting for me is, you know, I have a lot of experience and I thought I had a really strong um, resume and LinkedIn and portfolio until I had to edit it because I have so much because I, <laughs> I've been around a while and, and you have to curate and, and you really have to think about what do I want to represent 
to the community that is going to be evaluating me on what is next. And if I feel really great about it, like a new outfit or, you know, um, something like really spectacular, then I'm going to, I'm going to shine and, and making sure that your resume is crisp and concise, your LinkedIn is crisp and concise, and your portfolio is crisp and concise. And there's a red thread that goes through all of it. The dots are connected no matter where anybody goes when they Google, you know, or look for Sharon Lassard, they can see, oh my gosh, all of these things make sense. It's and it's not everything that I've done because not everything that I've done is noteworthy. But what is noteworthy that's really going to make me stand out from the rest of the candidates that I'm competing against? Those are great points. And Winston, were you going to say something? Um, no, I was just just kind of kind of um, I was supporting what um, what what Sharon was saying. It's 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 about a brand. Mm -hmm. It's 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 about a brand, and it's about your brand. And uh, the advice I would give to, to younger folks right now, start collecting now. Start writing things down now. Start paginating today so that the other thing that, that for young people is th th this, is a, this is an evolving work, your portfolio. It, it, is, it is a consistent work in progress 15 years from now, it's not quite as much, but right now it is. And so start, start scrapbooking now, images, articles, thoughts, quotes, whatever, how, whatever your creative process is, put that stuff in a folder on your desktop. So when it comes time to have to sit down and craft your final product, You've got so much content. You know, you know Sharon said it's, it's hard to edit. Yeah, it's hard to edit. But look, when you've got that much stuff and you spread it out, Sharon's eye is good enough to know that one, that one, that one, and that one. Then build your story from there. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that have like a longer, deeper, more experience in your careers, you know, don't, you know, when we say edit your portfolio and curate it to the, you know, to the opportunity, your website can be compartmentalized and divided up. There's nothing I love more than like, you know, stalking someone on LinkedIn or looking at someone's website and going like, oh, wow, they can do that. They can do that. Because you never know. Um, and Genevieve can speak to this, you know, when I just recently hired and onboarded my team, you know, we, we sought certain skills that are paying dividends right now because they have that in their background. So there might be something in, you know, your background that we need to pull in, um, you know, into an opportunity. So um, yes, edit and curate your portfolio, but your website, your LinkedIn, that's, there's a lot of great meat there that, you know, we want to be able to um, put on our menu at our restaurant. And, there, and, there, and, there's, and there's room to do it. You can, you can do it in those, in, 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 on those platforms, on LinkedIn to a great degree. On your, on your website, you can, just, you can just stack your website full of stuff as long as it's this beautiful thing that you can navigate, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's where you can show breadth and depth whereas with just a traditional portfolio you've got to show you you this is a this is a 50,000 foot view of detail um Genevieve there was a question in the chat oh there's a question in the chat yeah, once you have worked at multiple firms, do you need to include on each project page which firm you worked at and when you worked with that client? Uh, having worked, I, you have to always give credit 
to the client, the firm, the team, no matter what. I mean, no just use what. that as a rule of thumb. Yeah. I think you can never go wrong yeah. at any point in life, um, sharing the credit and accepting the blame. Uh, yeah. Those are, that's a, something to just live by. With the same enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So we have a couple of questions still in the question and answer. Uh, one of them, I think that you did touch on of advice for a candidate with limited content. It, how is hypothetical design perceived from the hiring side? Can it demonstrate the same aptitude as paid actual project content? Which I think, you know, based on our conversations, we feel like that's fine. I mean, it's really you're, you're hiring somebody for their creativity, for their thought process, for their abilities, not necessarily for what they were previously paid to do. Yeah, and I, I also understand what you're applying for. Um, because then your narrative can help illustrate verbally a little bit where you're lacking visually. Um, and again, how do you get to the conversation? That's when you can sell yourself on the bigger idea and the bigger expression about how you can add value creatively if you've got a limited visual portfolio. This is completely off topic, but I think is I think it's appropriate, and I thank Sharon for for dropping a an idea in my head. Um, but 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 it'll tie together. If you're looking at a job description, the first thing you should number one don't be seduced by a title. Also, don't be discouraged by a title. Number two, copy and pay copy that job description and paste it into a new document and have an answer for every single bullet point on that resume, on that job description. If you are batting 800 or less, walk away from it. You may want it and you may think you might be able to talk somebody into giving it to you. The chances of that are two slim and none. To Sharon's point, when you zero in on what they're looking for, you know how to respond to it. That's what I, that's what I'm the message here. When you understand, remember your Freud, once you know the problem, you know how to handle the situation. Once you know what they're looking for, you know how to respond to it. And I, I want to just tack on to what you said, Winston, and having the, I want to make sure that people have the confidence. And a lot of times we see when, you know, there's eight bullet points of what their hiring manager is looking for in a job. If you have six or seven, I, I would say it's still worth applying to the job, but being honest about what you don't have, um, rather than feeling like you're limited to apply unless you meet every single bullet point. It, it does give you the opportunity to identify gaps and it gives you the opportunity to develop responses as to how you're going to approach those gaps. Maybe 800 batting average is a little, a little, a little, maybe I'll lower that to 700. Six out of seven, I'll give you. Five out of 10, I'm not going to give you. I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, so we have two more questions here. Um, the first question is, um, we mentioned consistency and consistency in the second portfolio, but that it was consistent, but it was also maybe a little bit boring. And so the question is, is consistency always memorable? And I, I'm assuming that means is consistency always is always good. I, 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 I think it depends on the consistency. I'm sorry to get granular here, but there's a, so, so there is a difference between consistent and repetitive. I, yes. Sharon, you want, <laughs> well Sharon, said. You want to unpack that for me? Yeah. That's, the, that's the only thing I can say. There's a difference between consistent and repetitive. And I think some of our comments and probably consistent 
was not the right word. If we were comparing the two, the organization was consistent. Um, we still had critique about how to make it more interesting, um, more inspirational, um, et cetera. So there was work to be done there versus not having a, a, a formula, if you will, um, or an artistic approach to the overall portfolio. Um, that's something to consider. One thing I want to, not to go backwards, but sort of play off of something that Winston was saying, but also something to consider from a, a hiring manager, and, and I've sat in both seats um, in terms of design firm and working for a variety of, of brands and hiring teams in both. Um, and it's really interesting, like from a design firm perspective, if you're applying to a design firm, make sure you know what they do. Do and I and I don't mean that sarcastically. Uh, sitting on the on the hiring side of a design firm, there were a lot of people that submitted resumes and portfolios to the job descriptions where they didn't qualify, but they just wanted to get into the firm, or they actually qualified, but they didn't really know where they were going to fit into the firm. You know, they just sort of sent in their resume and and their portfolio, like be really deliberate in terms of why you're applying for something. Because if you don't show up, like you know who you are, what you're applying for and how you can contribute, it doesn't matter if you're really talented, you might get looked over because you might not be the right fit at the right time. And so that's something to consider. I think on the design firm side, um, you know, from, from my perspective, on the brand side, make sure you're qualified, you know, uh, in terms of the role. Again, really read that job description and understand, do research on, on what that brand does and what they're looking for, et cetera, and, and be deliberate in terms of if you get to that interview stage, like how you can contribute, whether you are new in your career or advanced in your career, like how are you going to change what, you know, what is happening in that brand? I, again, most recently had way too many people apply for jobs that they weren't qualified for. And a lot of things go through algorithms these days before they ever get to the hiring manager. So back to Winston's point about, you know, understanding what is the job, cutting and pasting and, and answering those questions. But if you have a cover letter or tweak your resume a little bit so that the algorithms pick up <laughs> some keywords to get you to that interview, you know, is, is really important as well. Um, so that, those sadly, are, those, sadly, those algorithms take the human out of human resources. Yes. But it, 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 it's part of, part of where we are in 2021. Maybe we should do a, 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 you know, one of these on interviewing and one on network yeah. and one on networking because it just, but, but I, I was going to pick up on something that, that Sharon said <clears throat> There are 8 million reasons that you won't get hired. There are probably only three or four that you will. And, and one of those is, and this is, this is at the top of the list, and I can't stress it enough, what is it that you bring? I'm echoing Sharon and, and Margaret shaking her head. What are the sandwiches you bring to the picnic? What's the wine that you take to your friend's house for dinner? What do you bring to the company? Every job in the world, every single job in the world is either a need fulfiller or a problem solver. I would argue that need fulfillment is problem solving. So every job in the world is a problem solver. What do you bring to the table to solve the problem? What's the problem that the firm is, is, is 
trying to solve for and what's your solution? I also wanted to chime in with two points. I wanted to remind folks what we said in our resume um, session last time. In addition to applying to the job, it never hurts to reach out to the hiring manager on LinkedIn. As a hiring manager myself, I just got several, oh, every time I log into LinkedIn, I get some people who ask if they can send me their resume. I personally love that. And then also I've had people who have reached out to me who are maybe underqualified for the role and also who are maybe overqualified for the role. And if somebody's really exciting and, and somebody that I want to work with, I curate a role for that person. Um, so I think that you should never be shy to put yourself out there and have the confidence and um, really just believe in yourself and put yourself out there because you will get zero of the jobs that you don't apply for. <laughs> That's that's beautiful. <laughs> I think that's an excellent point, Genevieve, because at the end of the day, your, your portfolio is a product, but we're hiring humans. We're hiring a person, and we want to we know who you are. What's your point of view? What's your aesthetic? What's your brand? Who are you? Is, are you someone that we can work with and collaborate with and have a mission together with? So, yeah. and, and, and I think, Mark, that that's, true. that's particularly true in uh, on the creative side i think creatives well they are they're just we're just mushier people yeah you know? we're just softer squishier more emotional less rational people as a generalization all i'm saying is remember that remember that creative people are looking for you know the the the, the fit the love what are what are we going to discuss in a four-hour delay at O'Hare during a blizzard? What are we going to talk about while we're waiting for the plane? That's what people want to know about ultimately. That is so true. Um, all right. So, Cynthia, do you want to come join on and, and, or, and give us some of your closing comments? Yes, first of all, I would like to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Winston, Margaret, Sharon, your insights were amazing. And um, I already see lots of comments coming in from people who, who really found this invaluable. Thank you, Genevieve, for jumping in to, um, to run the Q&A. Um, I really appreciated that, um, that help. Um, I'd like to thank again our international sponsor, Planet Construction. Um, and also, uh, Winston, I heard you saying we should do an interview part of the series. That's next. So for all of our um, attendees listening out there, um, the interview and how to interview uh, will be the third part of our series. So keep an eye on your inboxes. I also want to um, put out a reminder to all of our attendees um, that membership for the Institute is free until May 31st of this year. So if you are not a member, um, please join us. Uh, we have some, some really terrific and wonderful things coming up, um, both on the international level and throughout all chapters. Um, and the greatest part about it is right now, because we are all virtual for all of our events, uh, you can really take advantage of your membership within the Institute and network uh, and get to know our chapters and our members as you can attend all chapter events all across the board. Um, and with that, I wanna say good night to everybody and um, we will see you soon at our next uh, our next episode of this series. Um, so have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.